The revolution is dead. Long live the revolution, wrote Eric Wahlberg, a Middle East political expert and author, shortly after the Egyptian military um, overthrew the country's democratically elected president, Mohamed Morsi, on July 3rd. As Egypt go through political upheaval once again, what do the events in Cairo and other Egyptian cities and towns mean for the region? Has the Arab Spring, which was supposed to bring hope and change to the Middle East, just become a distant memory as supporters of democracy and change are still battling with the forces of repression and stagnation? Some say wherever Egypt goes, most Arab nations go. And per the events that followed the Egyptian revolution of January 25, 2011, all the way to the supposed second revolution of June 30th, 2013, and what happened since then, we know that Egypt is going down a road of political uncertainty, violence, and far from the initial hopes and aspirations of the Egyptian and Arab peoples. We are joined by five distinguished guests today to help us navigate through some of these very important questions about the challenges facing democracy in Egypt and their overall impact on the Arab world. With me, I have Yasmin Rashidi. Uh, Yasmin is a frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books and the author of the Battle for Egypt Dispatches from the Revolution. I also have Mehmet Chalabi, works actively with the Turkish, uh, with Turkey's political leadership on issues ranging from U.S.-Turkish relations with the Arab awakening and the Middle East policy. Lamiz Andoni, political columnist and veteran journalist on Middle Eastern and Palestinian affairs. With me is also Ma'moun Al-Abbasi, uh, an Iraqi writer, news editor, and translator based in London. His op-eds, reports, and reviews appears in a number of media outlets. Last but not least is Dr. Dawood Abdullah, uh, a writer and contributor to Islamic political radicalism. He is also the director of the Middle East Monitor in London. I'm going to start with you, uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah. And my question is this. How do you classify what happened in Egypt on July 3rd? Was it a military coup or a necessary step to reclaim the country's civil institutions and perhaps resituate the country back on the path of democracy? First of all, I, I wish to express my thanks to uh, Ramsey, uh, to yourself and your, your team uh, for this invitation. Uh, my view on this matter is that uh, a, a coup, a military intervention, uh, has taken place in order to reverse uh, the will of, of the Egyptian people uh, through the uh, uh, choice of the president, uh, Musi, uh, and this was a pattern that unfolded over a, a period of time. Uh, June, the, 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 what happened on, on the 3rd was actually the, the culmination of a series of, of events beginning with the annulment of the parliament, the, the, the constitution, the, uh, the the Shura Council and, and now the, the, the presidency. So it, it is clear that this has been a, an attempt to abort uh, the will. Mind you that they had on four occasions voted in a particular way, all of which has now been annulled. Uh, in, in that sense, uh, we can say that it has been a, a military coup. Um, thank you. Yasmin, uh, what is your take on this? Was it a military coup or a necessary step for uh, bringing uh, Egypt back to the path of democracy? Um, I mean, I hesitate to call it a coup. Um, I don't think that... I don't think the army could have done what it did without the people. I don't think the people could have done what they hoped for without the army. Um, I think that, you know, when you look back at Morsi's year in office, he was, the, the government was, was acting in a manner that I think was more of a dictatorship than under Mubarak. He issued a constitutional declaration that gave him sweeping and ultimate powers over everyone, including the judiciary. 
they wrote, uh, they drafted a constitution very hastily and with a majority Islamist body and passed it very, very quickly before the, con the, the, the body that, that, you know, was, that was expected to draft it was dissolved um, by the Supreme uh, Court. And so, you know, we did not have democracy under Morsi. And in that sense, I think it was a necessary step. Did it, was it executed in the right way? That's where I have a lot of question marks. Uh, Lamise uh, Andoni from Amman, uh, how, how is a military uh, democracy should be executed? Um, was, this, was this a wrong step altogether or was it necessary uh, but the execution uh, was perhaps uh, a bit too haphazard? Yes, frankly, I'm very skeptical, although I agree with my friend uh, Yasmin about the important uh, uh, violations uh, exercised by Morsi, uh, uh, especially the exclusionary process in which the Constitution was formulated. Uh, however, I am skeptical because I don't trust the military. I, first of all, uh, the military leadership in Egypt, and as our friends in Egypt, regardless on or, or which uh, in which camp they are, uh, remember that the army has made very important violations, including a, a shooting of demonstrators. Secondly, uh, what I'm worried about the most is that uh, this uh, is this communal divide. As a, this, uh, as a result of the, uh, the removal of Morsi, we're, we're witnessing the evolving or the deepening of a divide, a communal divide across the Arab world. We're seeing it in Jordan, in Palestine, everywhere, between the people who perceive themselves as secular or anti-brotherhood and the brotherhood brother, uh, power base. So this is what concerns me the most. Because what's the use of trying to restore anything if they have civil war in Egypt or criminal strife in Egypt or anywhere else? Especially that after the the step has been taken, uh, uh, the the action of people who are against, including myself, I'm against the Brotherhood, but it doesn't give me the license to. It shouldn't give me or other people on the secular side or secular camp or trend the license to agree with the arrest of the, uh, among the Brotherhood leadership, including Morsi, I, I, I see that it's, it's, uh, it's, it was not a necessary step. And uh, the campaign against the Brotherhood as a Brotherhood. I mean, you can ideologically oppose the Brotherhood, but we cannot exclude them from the process, and we cannot treat the power base of the Brotherhood as if they are not part of the Egyptian people or of the Arab people. And I see that this is happening. And it, and many and us intellectuals have a lot to be blamed for, or if we are intellectual, if I am an intellectual. Uh, but isn't um, I guess one of the problems that lots of people are having is is phrasing the question is it, uh, itself. I mean, if this is a question uh, about democracy, uh, aside from all the ideological and religious divides, shouldn't the people? Uh, kind of pretty much make the determination, and the Egyptians have made that determination loud and clear five times, two referendums, three elections. They voted for the uh, Islamic bloc, for the Muslim Brotherhood. What right does the, uh, the army have? And this question is for you, Mamun. What right does the army have to decide to interfere on behalf of the people, defining the people in any way they wish, and therefore uh, uh, basically uh, reversing all that has been achieved? as far as the democratic process is concerned? Well, uh, it doesn't, frankly, it doesn't have any right. Uh, it's, it's simple as that. And the, uh, the demonstrations in Tahrir Square, um, uh, they are legitimate, they, they are um, opposition demonstrations. But these demonstrations would never bring down a democratically elected government. It was the, the uh, action of the army and only that, that can bring down a de democratically elected government. Um, while it's true uh, that the... Um, the presidency, the one-year presidency of Morsi hasn't been um, an example of an ideal democracy, uh, not that such thing exists, um, it's, it's still, it's a, it's a democracy that needs to be reformed, it's a democracy that needs to be improved, it's a de democracy that needs to be under pressure from the street. But the alternative that we have right now, it's an absolute dictatorship, it's simple as that. 
and everybody speaking in the, in the name of the Egyptian people, the Egyptian people are kind of divided. The only way you would know um, which is the bigger size is not through a helicopter view where you count heads, the way you count sheep, it's through the ballot box, it's not through um, petitions where one person goes on TV and says, I've signed 16 copies proudly, it's through the ballot box, th through free and fair uh, ballot box. If um, the opposition of uh, was really interested in democracy, they could have brought down, if they were confident of their numbers, they could have brought down the president just in two months' time by taking part in the parliamentary elections, having a majority there, then they can impeach the president, um, rewrite the constitution or amend the constitution democratically, legally, legitimately. No, no civil war, um, and, and this would be the biggest defeat for the Brotherhood to go out fair and square through the ballot box. They, they chose otherwise. Thank you. Um, let me let me bring uh, Mehmet into this, and, and I have this hunch that he is going to be bringing the the Turkish uh, experience uh, into this debate. How did Turkey figure things out? There's been this uh, push and pull between the government and uh, and the military for years, and uh, now we do have a, a, a civilian government in Turkey. Do you think the Turkey Turkey anal analogy is um, uh, is in any way relevant to this debate? Um, thank you. I, I want to, first of all, um, before bringing Turkey, you know, I just wanted to clarify something. Look, military by definition is a privileged group of people, a pri pri privileged group itself. Um, it's by structural nature, it's authoritative. And as such, nowhere did the military ever bring democracy. And in fact, military and democracy are and is an oxymoron. So uh, let me begin with this. Second of all, in terms of um, looking at it, look, I'm not an Egyptian, obviously I can never feel what the Egyptians have felt. Having said that, as a son of the region, as somebody who's concerned with the region, uh, we're a country that, uh, like Turkey, uh, is really uh, um, involved and cares about the stability of the region. You know, the transformation in 2011 that Asia went through really excited the region. It excited all of us who had seen one brutal dictatorship after another fall. Um, this is a history of with long traditions of, of uh, um, uh, customs and tradition, uh, one of which is not definitely democracy. Having said that, the, the you know, why is was this important for Turkey before addressing whether this is similar to Turkey or not? Because Turkey has shared a lot of things in common with Egypt in terms of history, traditions, customs for centuries. Um, so wait, success in Egypt was very important for Turkey. Now. Turkey has always been taught, uh, being shown as a model for for many countries, as as the only Muslim democracy, as, as the only Muslim majority country with a democracy. It's not something Turks um, are are proud of, or at at least it's not something that Turks say, okay, we are a, a, a model because no single country is the same model as the other. Uh, our histories are not the same. Having said that, to us it's very important because. Turkey wants other countries in the Muslim world, in the 1.3 billion Muslim world, to be successful. They, we want to show the 57 countries around the world that are Muslim majority of the countries that, yes, success is not defined just by Turkey, by the Turkish experience. There has to be other countries that succeed, whether it's Malaysia, Indonesia, Egypt, uh, you name it. So that's why Turkey has been supportive of, of a stability in the region. Also, um, you know, Tur Turkey wants, for its personal purposes, Turkey is a fast, rapidly growing economy and wants stable markets in the region. So there's another region, of, uh, 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 personal reason for Turkey to be involved. Having said that, you're talking about Egypt now, and you're talking about criticism of the Egyptian model, but here you have, for the first time ever, a democratically elected president with no judiciary that is fair, with no police force, in fact, police force has been striking constantly, with no legislation, you have a, uh, an outdated constitution, you have an inherent corruption, as it is in all the Middle East, and on top of it, you have a horrific economy. And then you hand this down to somebody and ask him in, in a matter of 380 days to come out with a solution, when he's stripped of all powers any president would have. So it's, it's really not been a, a just fair... Uh, uh, um, fair criticism of Morsi, despite all the problems that, uh, uh, or at least all the criticism that he may deserve, or the Muslim Brotherhood. But 
a democracy should be able to address these things in a democratic way. And, um, and let me let me I'll kind of take that point and and bring Yasmin back into this discussion. Um, there is a democratic way, Yasmin, is it not? And what is the democratic way in Egypt? Is it the ballot box, or is it uh, when a group of people decide to gather in in mass in this square or the other and and uh, decide? who define uh, the Egyptian people and how should democracy uh, be reconstructed to fit um, this group or this other group's expectations? How, how does it work exactly in Egypt? I mean, I think that, you know, the question of what dem what is democracy is, is kind of a critical one that one, everyone agrees on. And I think if one looks back historically at the push for democracy in the Middle East, which came with the U.S. administration and um, and other administrations, it was always the, the talk of the ballot box, but I think that in Egypt, I mean, it's proven that the ballot box is not the free and fair way. The last elections were very, very clearly rigged. All the elections we've had, I do not think they were free and fair. Um, the opposition camps have asked Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood time and time again to sit down for a dialogue, for a discussion, they have dismissed or rejected those calls. Um, you know, they haven't, they haven't been willing to work. And I think, yes, the Egyptian people have learned that the single way for their voices to be heard is to take to the streets. Whether it's productive or not in the long run is another story, but that's the, that's, that has become the last resort. And that's exactly what they did. And, and going back, someone said that the military has no right to interfere the people, and I was there obviously, the people asked the military to intervene. The people called for the army to come to step in and, and sort of help them. So I think that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. Was the army behind this movement, did it quietly support the Tamarod movement? That's a whole other story. But the people did ask the army to become involved. Okay. Now, um, um, Dr. Dawood Abdullah, let me ask you this. Um, the people have the right to go to the street and make their voices heard. And as happened in January 25, 2011, overthrow the regime that they perceived to be dictator uh, uh, or a dictatorship. Why was that okay in January 25, 2011? It's not okay in June 30, 2013. What changed since then? Well, I think in the case of the, the Mubarak regime prior to 2011, it was clear to everyone, uh, both inside and outside of Egypt, that this system uh, was seriously flawed. The elections uh, were yani, systematically rigged over and over again. And as, as such, uh, the people resorted to a mass protests. I mean, it, it was a situation in Egypt, many of us would recall that even protests, you know, popular protests was, was quite limited. But it, it, it came to a, a point where people lost the, the fear of the regime, of the security forces, and they, they came out on the streets uh, to uh, express their, uh, uh, their dismay and, and their rejection of, 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 the, of the dictatorship, as we saw in, in France, for example, in, in the 18th century, a popular uprising. But having done so, they, they, there had to be a system of, of governance and the internationally uh, accepted system is that of a, a democratic uh, form of rule uh, through the, the popular vote, uh, through a parliament, through a constitution, through a, a, an independent judiciary. And, and, and there were attempts to you know, install all of these, but they were subverted at every turn. Uh, and, and this is a problem. Now, a precedent has been set, uh, and, and, and first of all, let's, 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 let's come to this, this uh, point, that when we say the people ask the army to intervene, we're speaking about a population of almost 90 million. Uh, can we really you know, ascertain how much of that 90 million had you know, uh, uh, participated in this uprising that allowed you know, the, the, the military to act on their behalf? It's very hard to say. Uh, it's a numbers game. 
and, and, and when we had the votes, in, in any case, they were internationally monitored. It was not like something done in secret internally in, in Egypt. The people came to Egypt and they monitored it. And, and they, in, in, in the main, confirmed that it was free and fair. There may have been you know, flaws, uh, errors made here and there, but it was not something that was massively rigged as in the time of, of Mubarak. But now we, we set this precedent that you, know, you can change your government on the street then you have the, the pro-legitimacy movement, as it would be, on the streets and saying, well, we will change it, uh, not through the ballot, but by having numbers on the streets. And, and the problem with this is that you would have clashes, as you had today, and they would become bloodier and bloodier, and the, and the society will become more polarized. So this is the danger that the country faces. Uh, let me, um, um, as an Arab intellectual, you're, you're watching this from Jordan and many others are watching from elsewhere and they are wondering, uh, not just wondering um, what is going to happen in Egypt next, but also wondering the, the, the fate of Arab revolutions in general. I mean, we started two years and a half ago or so with much hope and much excitement that things could finally change to the better, but things are not. And Egypt was perhaps that sticking point where we felt like we still don't know where Egypt is going. And uh, as of July 3rd, we now know it's not going anywhere near what we uh, uh, have hoped for in the past. How do you feel about this? First of all, yes, I'm watching from far, but not from very far. And I've been to Egypt four or five times since the elections. And I actually participated in some of the protests myself against uh, Morsi's, uh, Morsi's uh, policies. Uh, not uh, 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 because, as an Arab, I feel that the situation in Egypt will affect all of us. Having said that, I'm very afraid of the polarization. I'm afraid that we are sending. First of all, I have to uh, to say that the millions who came out against Morsi's uh, Morsi. I uh, have sent a message to the Ikhwan and Morsi, and I dare say to any future winning uh, uh, or ruling uh, president, whether he's Ikhwan or not, uh, uh, Egyptian or not, that the exclusionary process, especially the way the, uh, the, the constitution was formulated, uh, uh, would not heed well, would not be uh, accepted uh, by the majority of the people, at least, if not all of the people. How, having said that, the polarization process is not just in Egypt. We're seeing it in Jordan today. There's a huge divide in Jordan uh, uh, because for the Islamists, uh, uh, they feel rejected. Of course, they have to reassess all of their mistakes. They have to know that the ballot box is not a vehicle to uh, monopolize power. And I think we have to also admit that the nationalists, the leftists, have not been a good example. All of the uh, governance, uh, the systems, and the regimes that were ruled by, uh, uh, by leftists and, uh, and especially by pan-Arab nationalists were exclusionary as well. So we shouldn't be hypocrites as leftists or Arab nationalists uh, to say that the, the, the Islamists are the only one uh, accused of uh, uh, monopolizing the power, but this is a new era where people elect their people, uh, their presidents. It's a post-revolutionary era, so people are not willing to accept what they accepted earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm very worried, nevertheless, that the Islamists will feel rejected, rejected and some on the margins uh, of the Islamic movement will be more radicalized. Uh, I'm also, as I said before, very, uh, very aware and very concerned about uh, the language of the anti-brotherhood uh, trends, not only in Egypt and the media, but also in, across the other wor wor uh, world. We are acting in an in, in exclusionary manner. Yeah. Um, no, you're Sorry. saying that we've tried other ideologies, we've tried other uh, other uh, schools of thought. <laughs> Uh, and that, uh, as we all know, was uh, to utter failure. But ultimately, we went uh, using a democratic process to the ballot box, 
and and the panel <laughs> decided that it is this group that is going to dominate the the whether the Shura Council, the Parliament, the presidency and the opposition would have got to retreat and play the, the 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 game the way it should be played this democratic game it doesn't have to be ideal but this is how it works you you mobilize and you get your supporters to bring you back to office four years from now or whatever that period that you are supposed to wait now are we here seeing that there's someone's trying to play around with the rules uh, perhaps change the rules altogether in the name of the people and if you could um, uh, answer that very quickly so I can uh, go to Ma'amun with the next question. Go ahead, Lamise. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, f I think there's a danger of that. There's a difference between accept uh, accepting that there is a real popular will or at least a big segment of the, popul of, of the population. I cannot say that uh, Maidan Tahrir uh, 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 represents all Egypt. It might represent me uh, ideologically or as uh, an Arab citizen, but uh, uh, we shouldn't exclude the others. However, the, mili the military, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me, but the military is not exactly part of the revolution, does not represent the revolution. It's, uh, in, in, in my view, the military is still part of the former regime. And the regime has not really changed. It's in, in undergoing change, but it's not changed. So this faith, sudden, only for sudden, in military, where when the main one of the main slogans, one of the main slogans was "Yasqut Yasqut Hakm Al Asker" down with military rule, it concerns me. We shouldn't. I mean, I don't know if we should put our faith in the military. I'm not talking about the Egyptian military, any military, but. That was the slogan of the revolution, and uh, uh, yeah, so. I, I, I just, uh, so we, mind yeah. I just cut you out here, cut you off for a second, so that I can get our uh, other guests to comment. Of, of course, uh, if, of course. If if the military is indeed part of the regime, uh, not part of the revolution, uh, Moon, then then why did the oppositions and those who are saying that they belong to revolutionary movements, whether Tamarud or any others, why did they call on the military? To intervene, uh, knowing full full well that they do not belong to any revolutionary force in Egypt, but in fact are the remnants of the old regime themselves. Well, unfortunately, and I'm not I'm not talking about people in the street, the the people who who are chanting Tahrir Square. I'm talking about the elites in the opposition. Um, they feel that they can never win via free and fair elections in two months' time, maybe not even in, in three three years' time. So the best shortcut is to support or encourage or to bless the military coup and because that will be followed by the persecution of the brotherhood. Then comes the next election, no brotherhood, no challenge, we'll have Mubarak style elections. Um, I'm assuming that's their intention, but can I just go back to one point where everybody seems to be speaking about the people. I mean the people are divided, number one, but what about the people, who, what about the people in Rab al -Adawiyya? What about the people who support their democratically elected president in the streets? I mean, I know they stole away their, their, their votes from the ballot box, but do, must they silence them? I mean, they're going out, they're protesting everywhere. They, they are also using the, the language of Tahrir Square. They're also taking the streets to the streets in their millions. So let's not forget that they are the people as well. How are we to know? How are we to know? Uh, where are the remnants, uh, or how are the remnants of the regime involved in manipulating the scene? I mean, there's been oh, a lot. Oh, of that's, oh, there's no doubt. I'll tell you, there's no doubt. I mean, one of the challenges to to democracy is not just that um, the presidency of of Morsi was not so accommodating to the opposition. That's one mistake. But then you have the counter-revolution movement and the corrupt businessmen who own uh, media stations who who don't want any. Um, uh, any progress when it comes to the uh, subsidies, the, the uh, uh, petrol subsidies, bread subsidies. Um, you've got also the corrupt judiciary. Many of them appointed by Mubarak personally. You've got, you've got to take, you know, they, they've got their interest, and that's clear. Um, the, the, if you go back to the military itself, who are the military? Mubarak was from the military. Sadat was from the military. Before that, Nasser was from the military. Mubarak was the vice president of Sadat. Sadat was the vice president of Nasser. Since, the, since 60 years ago, and it's, Egypt has always been run by the military. When Mubarak was forced to step down, the military was replacing their left hand with their right hand. 
Now, I know there are good, honest revolutionaries. Some of them got carried away. Some of them are influenced by the media. But now, who, which side is really against, who, which side is really fighting the revolution? Just think of it that, that way. Who is really fighting the might of the military and the, the deep state? Just look at it. I mean, you've got people saying, uh, we are the revolutionists. Oh, yeah? Well, which camp are you in? You are praising the revolutionists and protected by the revolutionists. Now, we've kept, you know, we kept hearing how certain segments, you know, call them brothers or the Freedom of Justice, <coughs> and so Freedom of Justice Party have um, come and uh, hijacked the revolution. All right, then we have a new revolution now. Okay, who's fighting for the revolution now? I don't think nobody, anybody can say, oh, they've hijacked it. They're fighting for it fair and square now. Can I, can I add an, just another point with, the, um, with, with regards to what lessons would the Arabs learn or other countries learn following e Egypt um, soon? If, if you don't mind, uh, Mamoun, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch sure. on this question sure. Sure. Uh, in a minute. Let me just go uh, very quickly sure. here to uh, Mehmed. Mehmed, you're watching this from Turkey. And, uh, and despite of the progress that Turkey has, has made in terms of uh, creating a, a divide between uh, where the military starts, uh, the military's authority starts and ends and, and civilian government, there has been uh, uh, recently uh, some polarization in the Turkish street itself, uh, uh, in, in the Taksim Square. Some people made comparisons uh, that Taksim Square is more or less the Turkish version of the Harir Square. Um, from, from Turkey, um, how do you see the, uh, uh, the situation in Egypt? Uh, is there is there this uh, indeed th this polarization? Is it something normal? Is it, is it something that is a, a component of any democratic process, or is it particularly uh, uh, unique to Egypt itself? Yes, thank you. I'm actually in the U.S. right now, but I'm I'm. Um, have to, uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, First of all, in terms of, uh, I just wanted to address one thing. The army has been invited. Uh, this time, it looks like the Egyptian army has been invited. They did not themselves come out on the street. They actually used proxy to do this. The proxy of opposition by the close of opposition surrounded the people on the streets who then um, chaos and then asked for the army to step in. Eerily similar what Turkey to what Turkey went through actually in the past. It's amazing how the criticism that I'm seeing of the Muslim Brotherhood today of Morsi, even when the elections of Morsi were coming to place, the pictures that we were seeing of Morsi, look at Morsi and his wife, and look at the past presidents of the Nasser or Mubarak and his wife, sort of depictions, were very similar to what Turkey was going through, what uh, actually Abdullah Gül and others were, were, were being accused of in the past. So from that point, yes, there is a lot of polarization in Turkey, and, 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 and unfortunately, it is being uh, politicized by different groups for different reasons. And my office happens to be across from Taksim Square, from the Gate Park, and the events that led to that uh, quote-unquote revolution um, in, in Turkey actually it was, was over, overplayed by not only the Turkish uh, uh, political groups, as well as certain groups that had a grudge against the ruling government, but also for but by the media, local and international media. I mean, it was shocking to see CNN sending war correspondents to Istanbul and broadcasting nonstop for five, six hours as though it was a war zone. Uh, you know, I, I, as somebody who was going to Turkey, I, I go every two weeks I travel to Turkey. I was getting calls from people asking me, you know, are you okay? Is this, you know, is the war going on? That sort of reaction from, the, from people around the world. So yes, uh, polarization exists in Turkey. It has always existed. But the problem is the difference is this time. Turkey's revolution actually didn't come uh, on June 1st or May 30th with Taksim Square. Turkey's revolution came actually in 2002 when the Turkish party came to power. And I say that as somebody, myself, as an Arab living in Turkey. Let me give you an example. My father is Syrian. My father's wife is Turkish. My father's tur uh, children are Turkish. Yet my father, every single year, just because he was an Arab, had to, to be deported to bribe officials to get back into the country to get a work permit. Had my father been a Greek, a Russian, a, an American, a European, he would have easily gotten a work permit. Just because he was an Arab, he was deported. So you had that kind of a regime 
that actually had military restrictions, had uh, uh, restrictions on freedom, um, yet people somehow seem to embrace that as a, as a form of um, uh, okay, simply because it was uh, the military's job to, to, to defend secularism in their own way, yet the, re the rights of, the free, uh, of individuals were curved uh, in every level of society. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Yasmin, I have a question here. I have a comment uh, from one of our readers on Facebook, uh, Waqqas Aziz Mer, I believe, uh, is saying this. Egyptians need to take it easy. One year is very little time for any government to deliver. People should have waited and voted Morsi out instead of this army take over. Um, should have Egyptians taken it easy and, and, and um, what would that mean exactly? I mean, one thing I just want to, A, I am kind of morally conflicted about a number of things, but I don't think we could have waited three more years. I, you know, you, you go down and forget about the city center, you go down into the governorates and you go out beyond downtown Cairo and you realize that people cannot survive anymore. People could not survive. The prices of everything had, had shut up. Crime was rampant. Um, I mean, basic human rights violations, I would say, were, if not as bad as under Mubarak, they were worse. We wouldn't have survived another three years. I, do I think that this was the best way, or the best way to handle the situation? No, I don't. I, I, you know, definitely we could have done it differently. Um, definitely the army, you know, I think it acted way, way too soon. And, um, obviously, because it was in their interest. So I don't think we could have waited three more years until you know presidential elections came around again. I do think we could have done it better. And I am obviously extremely concerned about, you know, what next. Um, but are, are we underestimating the problem here? I mean, the whole um, uh, phrasing of the issue to be that of democracy or not, uh, Islamist versus seculars. I mean, Egypt is a country that has been uh, uh, sitting on, on, a, on a volcano of problems. Uh, and, it, and these problems erupted two years and a half ago. And neither Morsi nor anyone else, frankly, would have been able to deal with these issues. Uh, so how could Morsi, and this question is still to you, Yasmin, could really be blamed for issues that it wasn't of his pro uh, making problems uh, of, of which he had very little control. And more importantly, the oppositions have been blocking and uh, his every move, smearing him day and night. So his supporters are saying, how could you expected us to do anything meaningful even within that one year? I have to be honest, I think the problem is, is, is two-sided. I think that neither faction, I mean both the opposition and the Islamists were not willing to work together. Um, you know, we need at this point and, and at, at points past it was critical that we put aside, we made compromises, we put aside some of the ideals we held and worked together to move forward. Nobody was willing to do that. The Islamists were definitely not willing to do that and I think everything they have done in terms of um, the parliament, Meglis Ashura, um, the constitution, the constitutional declaration, everything they have done has proven that and the opposition at the same time are completely fragmented. You know, they take two, one step forward and two steps back. They're always bickering. There's a lot of infighting. So I think, you know, it's there. there many people are at fault, or every faction is at fault in a sense. And we need to set aside our egos and set aside, you know, everyone with their great idea and sit down at the table and work together. Nobody seems willing to do that. They, didn't, they weren't willing to do that a year ago. They weren't willing to do that when Mubarak stepped down, and they're still not willing to do that. Um, I have about five questions, and I really appreciate your patience and, and, and your answers. Um, I have about five uh, minutes, rather, left, and, and I'm gonna finish that with a question. I'm gonna start with the, uh, Dr. Dawood Abdullah from London. Uh, where now uh, Egypt? Where is Egypt heading, uh, considering what is taking place and, and the bloody uh, massacre that took place today? What is the future hiding for Egypt, Dr. Dawood? 
I, I think it's a, a very dangerous uh, situation it finds itself in today. Uh, uh, we hope that it does not uh, evolve or deteriorate into that which we see in Syria, uh, where you have a, a regime determined to use force against its, its civilian population. Uh, there are very, very disturbing signs uh, which manifested themselves uh, this morning uh, in, in uh, eastern Cairo. Uh, but, but that said, I think that the, the Egyptian people who had the, the will and the determination and the bravery uh, to bring down the Mubarak regime will also use that, those same resources uh, to ensure that legitimacy is restored and their will is respected. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I believe, I still have faith in, in, in the future of Egypt. Uh, its people recognize that they have a, a, a historic role to play in, in this region. They have done so uh, during the process of decolonization in Africa. Had it not been for their efforts in the, in the early 20th century, indeed the late 19th century, uh, uh, perhaps the decolonization of Africa would have been delayed. Today, the, the struggle is not for decolonization, but for uh, democracy. And Egypt has a, a similar role to, to play today. Unfortunately, there are people in the region and without the region who would not like to see this succeed. Uh, their, their vested interest lies in, in, in autocracy, it lies in, 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 uh, in, in uh, holding uh, autocratic rule over, over their people. And so a lot of money has been invested from without Egypt uh, to, to, to stall this process of, of democratization, this transition to popular rule. Uh, we, we, the, you know, governments, the, the way they welcome the, the, the coup in, in recent days is, is a clear indication that it, it is in their interest to support a, a, a reversal of the, of the, the popular uh, revolution in Egypt. Thank you. Uh, my producer is telling me uh, that we have only one minute left. Uh, um, I am sorry that I cannot uh, get to the rest of my guests with more questions. Uh, it was very uh, uh, informative uh, discussion. Thank you so much, Yasmina Rashidi, uh, Mehmet Chalabi, Lamis Andoni, Mamoun Abbasi, and Dr. Dawood Thank Abdullah. You. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, till next hangout, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.